All right. We will uh, just chat a little bit here while we wait for people to show up in the live stream in a couple minutes, and then we'll get this show on the road. Sounds good to me. My, my beard is starting to get out of control here. <laughs> I feel like your gray comes in even. You get the nice streak. Yeah, I got I got this this like weird thing going on on the chin here. These these uh, LED lights here really sort of accentuate the uh, the <laughs> the gray in my chin scruff. Yeah, I can't actually grow a beard, so. No. Oh, you poor poor man. It's this this is glorious. This is mm, you can stroke <laughs> your beard when you're waiting in line in the supermarket. You just like stroke your beard. You're like mm. oh, yeah, I do the scruff all that. Mm. Nothing. No, I just get really itchy. Terrible. Yeah. So you're in your uh, your shop there. Yeah, this is um, the little the, the corner of my shop that actually looks like not a well from what you can see like here up doesn't look terrifying. Yeah. Like that half of the garage is the uh, the mess from all the the stuff I've been doing for Marvel the past couple of days, mm -hmm. which I can't show. Yeah. Yeah, we got we have uh, space guns behind us here. Ta -da. Yeah. Those are getting pretty excellent. Let me go grab one real quick. These guys here, Brittany's been painting these, and there are a bunch of them all done, ready to go. Awesome. These are these are really cool. We'll do a photo shoot. It's I've never had like that many finished space guns all in one place. Right. So I'm excited to like do a photo shoot, like have them all lined up and stuff. Up like your actual like your arsenal or your armory. Yeah, got a this sight thing there. Oh, yeah. Laser cutter. The uh, the sights were done with the laser cutter. Yeah, not yeah. my laser cutter. Actually, I had those sights cut out by Pinoco a long time ago, uh, before I had my own laser cutter. All right, it looks like we have uh, some people showing up here, so I say we get the show on the road. You ready? Cool. Yeah. All right. Hey everybody, welcome to Prop Live, our this weekly show that we do where we take your prop and costume making questions and answer them to the best of our ability. Uh, this week we've got a guest on, a buddy of mine that I just saw a couple of weeks ago. We got Mr. Solo Robota himself, Steve Remiser. How's it going, buddy? Hi, everybody. You uh, down in uh, sunny Southern California? Yeah, down in Los Angeles today. It is threatening rain. It's oh. Like 50 degrees. My oh. goodness. But two days ago, three days ago, it was like 85. So, I'll tell you what, it's getting pretty awesome up here in Seattle. I think it, I went for a walk today. It was 60 degrees. Oh, it was so nice out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually got. I've been doing some painting, and in, in my uh, my little paint area that I have over there, I put a space heater in there, and it's probably like 85, 90 degrees in oh, that little room. Okay. Yeah, so when I spray paint something, it dries like right away, which is pretty awesome. Uh, for those, for the uninitiated, Steven uh, runs this, this little company he calls Solo Roboto. You can go to soloroboto.com and check out a bunch of this stuff that he's got going on over here. Like this super cool Ant-Man helmet that I got to check out uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and also, you can go over to Facebook and look at Solo Roboto Industries. Uh, Steve, how long have you been doing this this whole uh, solo Roboto thing? And where'd the um, name come from? Let's see. I I started making props in 2007, 7 or 8, is what I like to say. Um, I've been doing this full time. My only source of income since 2012. Uh, middle of 2012, so uh, about three years now. Right about when I, actually, I had the three year anniversary on mine in April. So yeah, right about the same time as me. Yeah. You're an old fart like me. Yeah, it'll be, it's the October, I think, will be like three years doing nothing, but um, that's when I, it'll be three, uh, three years ago, October, I moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. Where'd I you move? Never got well, Before that, I was in San Diego. Oh, big, uh, yeah, big move. Woo. Yeah, big move. Where? So where did the name uh, Solo Roboto come from? Um, it actually came when I was in college and I had a, a multimedia class where we had to build a website in Flash. Oh, flash. And uh, I, I actually, side note, I had to teach a class on Flash, and I don't know anything about it. So those poor high schoolers got nothing out of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, all through high school, I got made fun of for being an emotionless, soulless robot with only one expression. 
Um, so when I started like, you know, a company, we had to buy a domain and set up a website and all that stuff. I figured I'd make one that I liked and uh, I was a robot and it was just me. So I came up with, for a while I owned Lonely Robot also, but that sounded really sad. Oh, That's why my little robot logo has a little tear. Really? Yeah. So you get a bigger version. Oh. He has a little tear there. I see that. We got it. We can go to little tear yep. or poor little guy. Yep, yeah. And that's the redesign of like the robot that I built in Flash where it was just, you know, a bunch of rectangles. <laughs> One of the animations was he like cried a little tear and looked at it. That was like my final project. Pretty good. I like it. Solo Roboto. It rolls off the tongue. Very it definitely nice. works real well. So uh, we got to hang out recently down at yeah. uh, a Big, Big Wow. Wild. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was great. Um, panels together. Yes, we, we actually shanghaied one another's panels. That was, that was a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun. Uh, for those who uh, are watching who uh, frequently go to conventions, uh, there's a lot of fun behind the scenes stuff, like when people do panels um, where someone, someone may say, hey, I'm doing a panel by myself. Do you want to just jump on it? And sure, it happens all the time. And it's usually a really good time. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more fun than being by yourself in front of a room full of strangers. Yes. Which I've done before, uh, yeah. and, and I'll do again probably, but it's always fun to, to run a panel with friends. Yeah. Uh, you've got another uh, really cool event coming up here called AC Boardwalk Con, ACBC. Yeah, uh, with... yeah. Um, Atlantic City Boardwalk Con. It's going to be in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and it's actually a week from today. So it's a four day convention like San Diego. It'll be like a preview night on Thursday, I guess, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it's their first year, it's brand new. Yeah. So they've got a lot of really awesome stuff planned, things that a lot of conventions haven't done before. So hopefully it'll be a lot of fun. Cool, I'm excited to hear about it. I will unfortunately not be there, um, but there's some really cool new things that they're trying, including a prop, not a costume contest, a prop contest. Do you want to tell it, us a little bit about that? Um, it is, uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, actually, my girlfriend, Kit, who's upstairs right now, came up with the idea after Dragon Con last year when she saw, um, like, Sunday Night at Dragon Con, for those of you who don't go, um, costumes, there's still costumes, but people sort of end up with just bits and pieces. And, like, all of us prop makers, like, I mean, it was, like, you, Will, Harrison, uh, Stephen K. Smith, um, I think Jesse Logger was there, and me and everybody basically brought like one thing. Like Steven had like the hand from his space marine and Will had his Star Lord helmet. And um there's just like you know, a bunch of us just sitting around basically geeking out over each other's props and just like trading them around. No costumes or anything, just the stuff. And she watched us just having a blast with that and decided that we needed a place to do that at a convention. Like an organized thing, because costume contest, everyone shows up, they all get to show off their costumes and talk about it with each other and go on stage. And, uh, you know, for a lot of us, like, we don't, like, I don't really make big costumes. I just make individual things. And, uh, you know, she wanted a place for us to show that stuff off. So we, we knew that ACBC was happening. We know the organizer. Um, and we pitched the idea to him in September, and he said yes. So we're, we're throwing it, as it'll be happening. And it'll be actually right before the costume contest. It'll be on the main stage. Um, Harrison Bolton Crops and Grant Imahara from Mythbusters are the other two judges. Pretty cool. Uh, those guys know a thing or two. Yeah, those guys know a couple of things. So it should be it should be really cool. We're hoping we get a lot of really good entries. I know there's a lot of really good people on the East Coast um, and in that area who hopefully will bring stuff in. And I've already seen a handful of entries online. They're just ridiculously impressive. So that's cool. Well, I'm excited. Uh, I know I've judged plenty of costume contests in the past, and often is the case where the prop part of an entire costume. Uh, gets kind of like second billing or you can tell it's the last thing that was made for the costume So I'm really excited to see what people turn out when the prop by itself is the main focus. Yeah, uh, like the, the, the main uh, Part of their their effort when they're when they're putting something together specifically for for competing. Yeah so. Yeah, one of our rules is that um, You can have a costume, but the costume can't count towards whether you win or not Mm -hmm. We'll have like a, a small part of like stage performance and your costume can sort of factor into like your presentation. So if you've got a cool prop that does things or a costume that supports it, great. 
Um, but you know, if you're Iron Man and your helmet is just sort of okay, the suit's not going to help you any. So it's I got you, yeah. off like their their thing, the one thing they cool. made. So I imagine there'll be a pretty heavy weighting on craftsmanship then. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, especially for replicas, because a lot of what we do is replicating stuff. So we sort of split it up into like four or five categories. I don't have the notes in front of me, but there was like a um, sort of like finish and polish, durability, on like how well can this like because it's you know for cosplay and conventions, you know how how long is this thing gonna last? If I if I don't just set it on a shelf for five years, will it survive? Um, how many different sorts of things did you do? Does it have lights? Does it work? Is it functional? Is it cast parts? Is it molded? Is it 3D printed? All that stuff. So we sort of, we tried to make it real even so that, uh, it's a real level playing field because we, people have so many different skills. Cool. To sort of even it out for everybody. Well, that's exciting. I'm really stoked to see how it turns out and yeah. hopefully it'll take off. Hopefully it'll uh, happen, especially if you and I have something to say about it. It'll happen yeah. in more conventions. We're, uh, for those of us out here on the West Coast, we are in talks with Kamikaze in Los Angeles to do it there. Awesome. Cool. We're waiting okay. to see how it goes at Atlantic City. And if it goes okay, then we'll be doing it here. Yeah. Well, if you need someone to help out with that, let me know. If not, maybe I'll enter. Maybe I'll bring uh, bring something that, uh, that I've got there to yeah. compete in the old prop contest. All right, cool. Well, uh, tell you what, everyone, uh, we've got some people showing up to watch live. We have the, if you're watching via the event page, there's the Q&A app there. You can submit your prop and costume making questions, and we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, we have a handful that we grabbed earlier today on my Facebook page. Uh, so why don't we get started? Why don't we dive in? You ready, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, I'm All ready. right. All right. Awesome. Mick Heil wants to know... Uh, Kind of the difference between L200 and EVA foam. And I think when he says EVA, he means specifically like floor mats. Probably. Um, right. Uh, because I think L200 technically is EVA. Uh, technically, I think it is. Yeah, it's just a specific density. Yeah. Have you had much experience working with L200 uh, and floor mats and or floor mats? Um, no, I haven't done very much with the L200 specifically. Mostly work with floor mats because that's usually all you need. Right. Um, I can say I have had a lot of experience working with both SM L200 over there. I used it exclusively for my um, uh, Titan armor, mm -hmm. and it is uh, a lot bendier, a lot more flexible than your normal floor mats. No, yeah, you can get L200 foam in different densities. You can get L400, which which is a lot more rigid. I would say the floor mats are probably more like a 300 as far as like the density is concerned. Um, the major advantage you get to buying the L200 is that it does not have a texture on either side. You can buy it in big rolls. You can buy it in a lot of different specific thicknesses and it doesn't have a texture on it. So yeah, that's it's also uniformly porous. Like mm -hmm. after buying like we uh, like this product I just did this week for Marvel was we did most of it out of the Harbor Freight floor mats. We didn't have a lot of time. And uh, those are supposed to be like those pockets of just like the bigger bubbles or a little divot or whatever. Whereas the L200 is just nice. And yeah. Uh, I've also found with the floor mats that they will not be uniformly thick either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of pros and cons. Uh, so I would say um, you can order L200 on Amazon now. The, the Foam Mart sells it there. Uh, it's not ridiculously cheap. It's, it's uh, pretty... I think it was like 50 bucks for a roll, a four foot by six foot roll of half inch. Uh, it's still a lot of foam. So if you want to throw a little money at it and get some to play with, uh, I recommend checking it out. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mikhail, for your question. Uh, let's see. Via the Q&A app, we've got some more questions rolling in here. We'll grab one of them. This is from Jackie. Uh, wants to ask about getting a super smooth metallic surface on a prop. Well, I think our buddy Steven knows the thing about too about that. Uh, she's specifically asking about that crown that you made. Oh, E2 yeah. E2. Uh, curious about that finish. How did you uh, how did you do that? That is, I don't have the crown anymore because the crown went to C2 E2. But this is uh, this is Kit's. That's my girlfriend. This is her Wonder Woman chest piece. Um, and this is exactly the same thing. This is real chrome. So um, they basically, what's underneath here is a cast part. So it's cast, I think this one's 300. So it's a urethane plastic. Yeah, it's a urethane plastic. 
Um, and then I'm lucky that there's a number of places that do it, but I'm lucky that I have a place 15 minutes from my house that I can drive to that does chrome plating. Um, he actually works with the Stan Winston School and Legacy and has been doing mm -hmm. stuff for 30 years. Like he did the Terminator movies. Um, he's done a bunch of Batman, Star Trek and stuff. So I'm lucky that place can put chrome on just about anything. That's not always true. Right. Um, but basically, if you take in anything that's like, it's got to be hard. Um, so things like foam are really, really iffy. He claims they've yeah. done that. Um, I'm not sure how. Sounds yeah, like I can imagine as soon as it starts to flex, then the, the finish yeah. would crack. But basically, you take something that's hard and smooth. Like, I sand all these parts to 1,000 grit. Um, with any scratches that are bigger than that, will show up in the chrome. And then uh, it's all got to be catalyzed parts. So, like, when I have to prime it to patch stuff, it has to be a two-part primer, automotive primer. You can't use rattle can stuff that'll react with the chemical process they use. Uh, but you basically. take it in with all catalyzed parts, and then they basically do a chemical process where they play it with copper. And actually, I'm thinking about it, that's what this will look like. I don't know how well it will show up on the camera, but you can kind of see the layers there, maybe. Um, this one was cast in onyx, which is a black urethane resin. So that's the black in the middle. And then you can see the copper on the outside edge. Now there's also some 300 in here, which is why it's two colors. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so they played with copper and then once they put copper on it, they can put any metal they want. So the gold stuff like this is, uh, I don't actually know what this is. It's just, they do like one color of gold and it's this and it's really pretty. Um, Ant-Man, which is this guy, I think this is a nickel plating, is what this is, so it's this really nice sort of dark chrome silver. Uh, when I first got these, if I'd waited one more day, he offered to do it in rhodium for me, which sounds really fancy. Um, it's just a different metal, and it's like a bright white silver. Um, and so they can put whatever they want on it, but it's, it's also very expensive. Mm -hmm. so basically, you get a part really smooth, and you, if you need to paint it, you put catalyzed paint on it, which is actually not that hard. And then you give it to someone else, Yeah. and they take care of it. Because especially in California, the copper plating is super toxic, so in California, it's incredibly regulated. Um, you can't do this in your garage. You would go to jail. Gotcha. Good if to you know. To first. Yeah. Good to know. Cool. Um, Jackie also, uh, let's see, has some Tamiya brush ons, but is curious about the cost and efficiency of spraying for a sword blade. Um, if you're doing something like a sword blade, yeah, you could go through the whole process of chroming it like you've done. Um, but I will tell you too, uh, I think that the time, there's a huge time and cost savings if you just use metallic paints. And yeah. the, the Tamiya paints are pretty darn good. Yeah, um, I really like them, and I'm a huge fan of Allclad. Um, Allclad. We'll, have to, we'll put a link to that in the in the show notes. Yeah, Allclad lacquers. They call them lacquers. They're not all lacquers, but they have a line of, like, 30 different metallics. And uh, outside of, like, the $300 spray can chrome paints, Allclad makes the best chrome paint I've seen. Cool. And you can you can buy an airbrush bottle for, like, $8. Yeah, that's awesome. And it looks really, really good. And you can clear coat it. You can actually protect it when you're done. Yeah, that's something I'd be very interested in playing with. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for your question. That was really good. Um, let's grab one. This is uh, Fearless Facade is is uh, sending the next question in, a, a regular in our, uh, in our question pool. Let's see here. Every mask I make starts life as a clay sculpt. Do you guys have any top tips for clay sculpting, especially with regards to keeping good symmetry? I've actually got a tip for that. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of, not a lot, I do a decent amount of sculpting. My Dr. Doom mask started out as clay, and it's got to be symmetrical. And when I did that one, I didn't know what I'm about to say, but uh, my friend uh, Sean Reeves, Reeves FX, you guys probably know him. He makes one of the best Batman DC verse cowls there are. And uh, he was telling me that what most of the big monster makers do is you you only do one side of the face first. You pick one side and you just do one half. 
and you get one half perfect. You don't like you just rough out the other side. Don't even worry about it. Um, and once you've got your one side done completely, then you work on mirroring stuff over. Because otherwise, you're just constantly flipping back and forth. And he says it's a whole lot faster than trying to be symmetrical as you go. So I end up just poking at everything all over the place. Right. And is that you? One side, just get it so it looks good the one half, and then you're basically like, copying uh, yourself on the second the second half. Yeah, uh, no, that's that's a good tip. And I fell in love with doing Star Lord. My Star Lord like wheels is all by hand. I fell in love with calipers. Yeah. Let's get a you know a set of like I just have the cheap Harbor Freight ones. So I got like, four different shapes, just like measuring stuff and getting an idea of how off you are. The uh, I had the chance. So my, my you mentioned the Star Lord. My shopmate Will from WM Armory has a Star Lord that he did, and he's walking by right now. And he's a background creeper. Woo <laughs> Uh, he did a Star Lord, and you also did a Star Lord. And um, I know for a fact that Will was working from like crappy screenshots when he did his. And I don't think you had much better references either. I was knocked out by how similar the two of you ended up with uh, with your sculpts. They were very, very similar. Yeah, you were telling me um, a big wow about this. We've got they're really close. Yep. Yeah. Which is, I think, says a lot about the fact that uh, you know. I hate sound like I'm bragging, but I think Will and I did a pretty good job. Yeah, you guys both did, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing about sculpting, too, especially if you're doing something like a face that's, like, recognizable, um, and it's kind of, this is a, a good thing to do with, uh, with uh, any sort of artwork, but if you take a photo of it from the, you know, straight on from the front, and then look at that photo upside down, any differences in the sides will pop out immediately oh, because yeah. you're no longer looking at a face. When you turn it upside down, you lose that pattern recognition, and then all you see are the, the glaring differences between the two sides. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge thing. If you can look at stuff from different angles, um, yeah, you'll totally see things differently. Yeah, or take an image um, if it's, let's say, maybe not symmetrical, and put it in Photoshop and flip it, just mirror it so that you basically just so that you stop seeing it for what it is and just, and start recognizing the component uh, elements of the form. Yeah, especially masks and faces because your brain is really weird with how it interprets faces. So yes. you can sort of get your brain out of the way and just look at the shapes, it helps a lot. Totally. Uh, thank you, Fearless Facade, for your question. Uh, this next one here comes from Solano. Uh, Solano wants to know, what up and upcoming projects do you guys have that you can talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I added that last part because I know Steven's got something really cool he's working on, but he can't quite talk about it yet. Yeah, the one that I was working on this week is from Marvel, and uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it yet because it's... Um, I'm not sure if it hasn't officially been announced, but it's, uh, it'll be at ACBC. Okay. So I'm pretty certain that once it's there, I'll be able to talk about it because it will be on display and people will see it. So hopefully I can talk about it then. Cool. So we'll hear about it in a week. Yeah. All cool. right. Well, would you have anything else coming up that you that you can talk about? Um, not nothing real big. I'm I'm trying to get caught up on stuff. I don't know if you can see behind me. There's a a steel sword from Skyrim right back here. Uh huh. This is my forever project that got started at my last shop um, a year and a half ago, and it's just been a back burner thing for a really long time. So I want to get that done. I've been terrified of molding it because it's like three and a half feet, four feet long. Right. And that scares me. Yeah. I just did. Um, I, I haven't posted about them yet because I have to. I mean, it's sometimes when you work for a different company. So, for example, I'm working for Crystal Dynamics to make the bow from Tomb Raider, which is really, really cool. Uh, however, I have to send them images uh, for approval before I post them on social media. And we also coordinate so that when I post something, they reshare it on their website, which is cool because then it gets a lot more traction. Um, so I haven't posted about it, but I have made a ton of progress on this bow from Tomb Raider that I've been working on. Uh, and I made a really big mold. It wasn't, well, I would say it's two and a half feet long, maybe maybe not three or four feet long. But I just built some uh, some fairly big molds for the bow. It's done in two pieces, so it's split in half. Right. Um, yeah, but I just made some big molds, and they're sitting right over there. And I can't show you guys yet, but I'm pretty excited about that. You, you just box molded, or is it a? Yeah, I was gonna do um, uh, matrix mold for it, 
I've never done one before. Um, I the problem is I got sick for like four days and I couldn't really work in the shop. So when it came time to make the mold, I just did a box mold because I knew I could do it really fast because I've yeah. done lots of those. Um, yeah. But I, I do have some projects coming up. Actually, um, it isn't finalized yet, but I do believe I can talk about it. Um, working with the guys at Tested.com. Uh, when I was down there, we were deciding on a project I might do for San Diego Comic Con, uh, where I build something for them and their the show that they put on during SDCC. And uh, again, not finalized yet, but uh, hopefully if that one goes through, that'll be a really fun project to share with you guys. It'll be a giant gun from something. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. Thank you, Solano, for your question. Uh, let's see here. This next question comes from Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne says, hey, Bill, do you still have some plans to mold a Titan helmet and sell kits? Also, are you still doing a write-up of your Titan armor? Thanks again. That's right. I forgot. So I started a write-up on the RPF for my Titan armor, and I haven't updated it since I finished the armor. So I, I need to write a note to myself to go finish that write-up. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm terrible at doing that. Yeah. Because you know what happened was like the like day one, day two, day three. I was like, all right, I finished work today. I will do an update on it. Day four and on, I was like, oh my god, it's not done yet. I need right. to work. It's working. It's yeah. No or anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do. Ha I'll tell you what I do have. Um, if folks, I can share this. Let, let me uh, let me see here if I can make this work real quick. Uh, Destiny. I, I want to share this with people because where is it? Titan costume. All right. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, there is no image. Don't worry, everyone. I will. Uh, I will be back in just a moment once I do that. No. All right. Hey, check it out. There's a folder on my computer. So this is my Destiny Titan costume uh, folder with like detail images. I have a bunch of screenshots, like uh, from the in-game screenshots that I did, and then here is my build progress. So I did keep really, really good track of my progress, and it's all sitting there. It took 17 days worth of work. Uh, so, for example, day 11, I don't. Oh, you know, all the folders, or I'm sorry, all the photos are on a different computer right now. But it's but someday I will put, I will get them together. Uh, but here's a description of what I did on that day. So I actually, it's definitely one of the most well-documented builds I've ever done. I just haven't finished that part yet. <laughs> so, yes, Suzanne, I will still, uh, I will put that up here at some point. Uh, I do want to make and mold a helmet. Uh, we'll see if I do, that'll be for Dragon Con. We'll see if that comes together. Mm-hmm. The end. Thank you, Suzanne, for your question. Uh, here we go. Another uh, this question's from Oriol, a uh, another regular that we we get in the uh, in the chat here. Uh, he says, "I'm in the way to make my own molds and sell props in big numbers instead of individual commissions, and uh, of course, I'll be selling on the internet. Could could I have copyright problems? Is that a problem you've ever had? Uh, tell me, Oriol, are you making anything that Marvel owns the rights to, or <laughs> Disney owns the rights to?" <laughs> because there, um, some companies are more litigious than others. I'll give you an example. I've made molds of uh, Mass Effect guns and um, sold blank kits of those. And so far, EA and um, Bioware have not come after me for that, which has been really swell of them, but they could if they wanted to. Uh, have you ever had any uh, a C and D or any problems like that, Steven? I, I have worked really hard to avoid them from Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, Marvel, especially now that's Marvel Disney, is uh, much more, like, they really watch that stuff, and they're very, like, this ours. Yeah. Um, and as long as you're making it for yourself, that's fine, but as soon as you start selling things, they usually care a bit more. In my experience, most of the video game companies are a lot nicer about it. Um, most of them seem to be more of the camp of, hey, it's cool that people like our stuff. Right. So you it's, gotta, I, I imagine that there's got to be an internal... I don't know this for a fact. I'm totally speculating here. Um, but there's got to be some sort of internal conversation that happens like at video game companies uh, where they say, you know, like, 
like we do own the copyright on this. We should defend our IP. Uh, but in this case, it probably makes more sense that we don't. Uh, if you do, let's say I'm making a Mass Effect gun and I, I build a mold of it, I can get like, I don't know, 40 good pulls out of that mold. That's still a really small number. When Oriel here talks about selling props in big numbers, for an individual prop maker like me or Steven, big numbers are 40 guns or 40 kits, let's say. Uh, for big companies like that, big numbers are 40,000 of them. <laughs> yeah. So, so long as you uh, d don't be really overt about what you're selling, um, don't say you're selling hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, and I would uh, and be cautious around companies that tend to be more um, more vigorous in their in their defense of their intellectual property. Companies like Disney. Yeah, I, I will say that there are. There is a threshold over which it does technically become illegal. I'm not supposed to say what that is because of where I know it from. Yeah. Um, but uh, as long as you're working in like small numbers, um, there's you know there's there's some weird loophole things of as long as things are individual or it's just you or if you're doing small batches then yeah technically okay. Yeah. But like you were saying, like is even in the you know 10, 20, 30. Is, you know, depending on how you go about it and whose copyright it is, you, yeah. you may or may not run into problems. Yeah, and usually if there is a problem, you'll just you'll get a cease and desist from a company that says, hey, I noticed that you're selling X and we own the IP on that and we would rather you didn't sell them. That's yeah. going to be the cease and desist. So long as you do comply, there's not going to be a problem. You just stop selling it. Yeah, and just to um, clarify for because I've had some people ask me and get confused. A cease and desist is not legal action. No, it's not. It is a threat of legal action, where if you don't cease and desist what you're doing, then they will sue you, and then mm -hmm. you have a problem. And you don't want that. So. No. no you because don't. they will win. They will win. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Oriel, for your question. Uh, this next one here comes from Lindsay. Uh, any thoughts about having, uh, oh, having a booth at the Seattle Mini Maker Fair doing live demos? The Bay Area Maker Fair is almost always almost always has a couple of prop replica booths. Uh, actually, the Bay Area one is next weekend, I think. Let me look that up re really quickly. Bay Area Maker Fair. Yeah, last yeah. year it was the same weekend as Day Wow. So right. I People who were like went to the Maker Fair on Saturday and came to Big Wow on Sunday and were asking why I wasn't there. Well, I was at Big Wow and I didn't know what was going on. So yeah, folks who are in the Bay Area next weekend is the Maker Fair Bay Area. Apparently, that's like the super cool one to go to. I've never been yeah. to. It. I've I heard will... really cool thing. Oh, definitely. I've never been to it and I won't be at it this year because I was just down there and I can't justify another trip. Uh, but it is really neat. Uh, I know that there is uh, Seattle Mini Maker Fair. There is one in Seattle. I've been to this one before. It's much smaller. It's like in. It's all indoors. Uh, September nineteenth through twentieth. Uh, application deadline July first. So yeah, that's definitely the sort of thing. Oh, it's at the EMP Museum, which is awesome. Um, I haven't been there in a couple of years, so I would definitely like to go check it out. And uh, yeah, Lindsay, I can't confirm, but uh, I would like to go. How about that? So that's about as much of a commitment as you can get from me right now. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm looking up here in LA, we only have like one small one and it's that's what we call the Inland Empire, mm -hmm. which technically LA, but it's still like two hours away from me. So it's uh, it's far away and it seems very, very small. It doesn't seem like the, the San Francisco one, like the Bay Area one seems amazing. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to add that to my calendar and uh, I will definitely have to see if I can go. Cool, all right, thank you, Lindsay, for especially for bringing that to my attention because I wanna go. All righty, uh, this next question here comes from Imantas, and I apologize for butchering your name. Let's see here, what material would you recommend for making an ice wing about three or four feet span from the shoulders. I'm thinking about using clear resin uh, hollow cast method, uh, but it would have to be low weight 
uh, it'd be hard to hide the support in the wings. So we're talking about big sort of wings that are lightweight and clear. Uh, I think I think that's going to be an uphill battle. What do you think, Stephen? Um, I've made clear glowing wings before. Uh, I did a blue beetle backpack for somebody that they had to light up blue. Um, and what I used was I used frosted acrylic. You can buy one eighth inch acrylic sheet that comes frosted on one side. You can also buy like window frosting at the hardware store if you just get clear acrylic. Um, but those are the window colors. frosting like a spray. Yeah, they make it. It's like for um, yeah, it comes in an aerosol can, and it's uh, like beer to like old windows where it's got that sort of like flat texture where the light comes through, but you can't really see through it. It looks sort of steamed up. It's like that. Um, and the, the reason I get that is because then the frosting diffuses the light. So if you put lights along the edge, the frosted part will catch the light and the whole thing will glow because I need them to be blue. Um, but acrylic, of course, is just flat. So when I think of ice, I think it's sort of textured. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I mean, like most, most clear casting resins are not lightweight. Um, most of them are also only if you really want to be clear like ice most of them are only clear if you can like either really really seriously degas them first and then not touch them which is hard because they usually take like 18 plus hours to cure or pressure cast them which you couldn't do for wings that big yeah you'd have to have a really big uh a pressure casting pot yeah I made, I've played before with, I made some Gambit playing cards once, and I played with um, taking clear plastic and pouring clear resin over the top of it. Like take some like smooth on 325, the semi-transparent stuff, and let it mostly kick so it's kind of gooey, and then pour it out almost like hot glue. And uh, I mean, hot glue would actually probably work decently well too, except that it's really heavy also. Um, there's not a lot of good ways to do lightweight wings, especially if you want them to be clear. But I've been trying to figure out how to do that because one of my dream costumes is to actually do the modern blue beetle with wings that are my size, which is big. more than arms width, and I'm 6'4", so I would need roughly 7-foot wings, which uh, doing that in acrylic is going to be like 25 pounds. Definitely, yeah. Um, you, it also may be the sort of thing uh, people are going bonkers now because there's clear warbler. Um, I think that a lot of folks think they're going to be making visors out of it. Um, I'm a little skeptical about that. But yeah. I, I do think you could heat form, like make um, uh, feathers, right? Like lots of feather pieces. That would work. Out of a clear warbler like that and kind of adhere them all together. Yeah. I would actually use PETG. Yeah. Um, PETG is a, a thin plastic, um, and it's totally clear, and it's super cheap. Yeah, it's, I, it's what they make Coke bottles out of. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you can buy like a full, like a big sheet of it for like fifteen bucks. Oh yeah, I have a I have a, a sneaky suspicion that clear warbler and PETG are very similar. <laughs> yeah, right. the only thing that you can't do with PETG is like ball it up and flatten it back out again. Right. But other than uh, that, very, very Yeah, fun. cool. So there are some ideas. I think uh, obscuring your support structure is going to be tricky if if it's clear. Uh, yeah. You're going to have some problems with that. But you may just end up spraying, spray painting the, the support structure just like a white or a light gray color yeah. so that you, it's just not as noticeable. Yeah, make it look like frost or something at the edge. Yeah, yeah. And on my wing, I built this, the, the outer edges. I built out of aluminum tubing and aluminum mm -hmm. channel. So it was super lightweight, but rigid enough. There you go. There's some ideas for you, uh, I'm in toss. Uh, so good luck with your winglings there. Yeah, if you figure it out, let us know, because, again, I need to make really huge wings. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, see pictures of that for sure. All right, uh, here we go. This one is from Sam. Uh, when making armor pieces, foam or otherwise, that enclose whole limbs, how do you make your joints free to move without huge gaps in your armor? Hey, you made an arm recently, didn't you? I did. So uh, yeah. uh, let me see if I can find a picture of that on your website or your Facebook page, which I've got open right here. Yeah, you have to pull it up. So I think I can actually grab it. I have the original, I think. Um, I've got it right there. There we go. This is perfect. 
Ta-da! So this is a Winter Soldier arm that you recently made, and you did some really cool creative stuff uh, so that someone could put it on and take it off, and also move their arm as well as look good in a photo. So you want to tell us a little bit about how you how you did that? Um, yeah, this one is, uh, unlike most armor, it's actually fully sculpted, but it started out like when I cast that one, or when I sculpted that one, the original, it was all one piece. And then I took it and I like, chopped it in half and made two molds because molding the whole arm is really hard. Um, but that, I guess you might have seen like in that picture, there's three pieces. So the forearm. Yeah, great, piece, we got the pieces right here. Yeah, so that forearm piece, that little bottom piece there actually slots in to the forearm. So, because um, it only has a little bit of give to it, so it's hard. So your hand kind of slides through that tube like this, so your thumb sort of sticks out, which is what that hole is for. So you don't have to like mash your hand in there. And then that little piece slots in with magnets. Um, and that design, so that one, the elbow has a flange on it. So when you assemble the whole thing together, it actually locks in with magnets so it's solid. Mm -hmm. So you can make the arm actually one piece for pictures. So then when you move, the magnets just come loose and you've got about like yay much movement. Right. There's a little video on my Facebook page. If you go there, you can see the guy in it. Um, there's a little bit of movement. It's not a lot. But it's, uh, it's enough to go about your day and to do poses and carry your props and stuff around. So for the most part, um, what I liked about it, and I think a lot of people have this sort of disconnect. Oh, we've got a, we got the video. I'll show in just a second. Uh, disconnect to where they, they want to build uh, a costume piece that just always looks exactly right and is totally functional. A good example is the helmet I made for my Titan. Uh, people are like, well, how do you see? And said, so, well, I don't, I don't see out of it. I just wear it for photos, and then I take it off when I need to walk around. Yeah. Uh, this is a similar idea. Uh, and here I've got this video of the arm pops out. He can move his arm around, uh, which looks pretty good. And there's a gap there. But when it comes for time for photos, he can snap yeah. it back together. Yep. And then he usually wears a, a silver sleeve under it. So for photos and stuff, if it needs to move a little, you've got some yeah something just to sort of mask that gap a little bit um for most armor bits that i do especially around the elbows or knees a lot of times i will rely on the the pattern on the undersuit to to fill that gap at least with something that's visually interesting uh so that it doesn't look like your arms are just floating on the ends of your 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 uh, biceps yeah, I think Iron Man is actually one of the few like comic book suits of armor where they designed it sort of practical. Mm -hmm. So you can actually build armor that way. It doesn't have, well, not really. You know, you can fake not having joints there and have it look okay. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get away from like traditional, like real world medieval armor into comic book stuff, it's it's just magic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's like in the winter, the Winter Soldier arm in the movie is ninety five percent CGI. Right. So like you you don't ever see a real arm do this because it can't. Right, right. And, and their their challenge with that uh, specifically was getting that high chrome finish on something that would then be flexible. Because yeah. like we were talking about earlier, putting a chrome finish on something that can flex would mean that the finish would crack off. Yeah. They do make some really, um, there are near chrome paints for rubber now, uh, but they cost $1,000 a gallon. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do it, but uh, I, I can get real chrome for less than that, which is right. Right. There you go. All right. Thank you, Sam, for your question. That was a good one. Uh, this one comes in from Nathan. Uh, my question is when I paint and heat form the heat bubbles, the foam, any tips to fix that? Uh, I would once. Once you're ready to paint, you're done heat forming your foam. Like if you're gonna um, uh, use EVA foam and you wanna get it down to a certain shape, get it to that shape before you start throwing paint down on it. Uh, remember that foam is porous. It's got a lot of air bubbles in it. And when you heat it, th that air expands. And if you have anything over it, like paint, it's going to bubble. Yeah. Yes, so there you go. Finish your heat forming first. Uh, I would say, like sometimes I will use a heat gun or a hair dryer to help paint dry, 
very gentle dry heat. Yeah. Real. Uh, but if you you even even if it's not foam, even if it's a nice solid finish surface, too much heat on your paint job can wreck it. Like you can melt your paint right off. Yeah, I mean that's what like paint like heat guns used to be sold as paint strippers. That's yeah. What they were for. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thank you, Nathan. See, this next one here comes from Patrick. Uh, hey, I'm just getting into prop making in the UK. Uh, do you know of any UK prop makers similar to yourself? Do I ever? I was just there. Yeah. Uh, do you know much about the prop making community here in the UK? Uh, is it as popular as it is in the States? Uh, I can say that there is def. I was just at London Super Comic Con a couple of months ago. There's definitely a really amazing sort of tight knit international cosplay community there. That's kind of what I got out of it. Um, I would definitely go check out my friends at Artifakes, A-R-T-Y-F-A-K-E-S, like artifacts, only Artifakes, because they're so clever. Uh, you can find them on Facebook if you look up Artifakes. Um, Tabitha and Nick are super, super cool. I got to go stay at their house while I was in uh, the UK. And yeah, the, the community there is awesome. They're uh, for example, Nick and Tabitha do live streams all the time from their shop. They do tons of foam fabrication stuff, and they share how they do, what they do. Uh, they have live classes in their studio, uh, so if you can get up to their place for that, I highly recommend it. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to kind of see uh, what they had going on, what the UK had to offer, and I was I was impressed. So, yeah. so definitely, yeah, you're in good company, Patrick. Go check it and out. If you're not on the RPF already, the RPF, the Replica Prop Forum, is international. And I know like a solid chunk of people on the RPF are in the UK. Yeah, definitely. You could even start a thread there or see if there's a thread already uh, going on uh, to talk about makers in the UK. Yeah, they've got a whole uh, sub forum for meetups and stuff. Yeah, totally. Go check I it out. Give that a look. All right. Let's see here. This question comes from Sam uh, from Bio Cosplay. He wants to know if you had any experience with Roscoe Flex Bond for sealing foam. I've been told it's similar to Mod Podge, but more flexible and requires less coats. Uh, our mutual buddy, Steve, uh, different Steve, Steve uh, wins it, actually. I believe he told me about this stuff, Roxo, yeah. Roscoe Flex Bond. I haven't had a chance to try it. Have you played with it at all? I, I have right behind me somewhere. I have a couple little sample jars that uh, that I got because Steve told me to go get it. Um, I haven't tried it either. Apparently, it's what they use here in LA for a lot of industry stuff. Because um, I guess you can tint it with anything and it'll stick to everything. Oh, cool! Yeah, here, check it out. This is their website. I'm probably gonna have to order some right now. Uh, suggested use: use it to adhere fabric to fabric, fabric to wood, foam to wood, or fabric and many other combination of materials. Um, that's really cool. Apply by brush, roller, or spray gun, which sounds really cool, because uh, I like doing that. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty awesome. Let's see. All right, cool. Roscoe Flex Bond. I will definitely go grab some of that and play with it. Yeah, that's tough. How oh, neat. Well, I wonder if you can get that on Amazon. If there is an Amazon link, I will We'll put a link to the Roscoe website in the, in the, uh, uh, show notes, but I'll also if they have an Amazon link, I'll look that too. Roscoe yeah. Flex, and it's yeah, the consistency is about like Elmer's glue or Mod Podge. So, all right, cool. I don't see a link on Amazon, so I'm not sure where I might buy it. Uh, but it definitely like the things that come up in uh, Amazon are talking a practical guide to theater, doing props and set stuff for theater. So that seems like. Yeah, their uh, their warehouse is here in Los Angeles, and that's where I got this stuff. And if you go in there, they're a theater supply company. So, like, if you find their catalog, it's ninety nine percent like stage lights and curtains and um, you know stanchions and things for holding all that stuff. But they also make that. Yes, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, oh, here I'm we go. Sure how you go about buying it? They actually have on their website where to buy. I'm going to say Washington State. Uh, Hollywood Light Services, Pacific Grip and Lighting, uh, Light and Stage, Stagecraft Industries, Seattle. So there are several stores in Seattle that sell this sort of stuff. There you so go. there we go. Cool. I may maybe I'll make a little road trip tomorrow. Uh, all right. Thank you, Sam. That's a good. That's great. I'm glad you brought that up too because I, I definitely want to try it myself. Maybe for the next Foamsmith book, I'll put that in there. 
Yeah, I always forget that I have it, and I still haven't gotten around to playing with it. So. Right. Uh, this next one here comes from Kevin. Let's see, he says, I'm having problems with my foam seam separating when I do final shaping and heat sealing, especially for layered detail pieces. How can I avoid this? What's the best way to correct this type of problem? Hmm. Uh, I do have a video on my YouTube channel. We'll link to it below. It's all about getting really good seams using foam. The, the, the two things I can say is have a really nice good cut, which means having a nice sharp knife. Uh, and then using a good contact cement like barge. Uh, you can see I've got a can right there. There's my barge. And uh, making sure that you, that barge covers the entire surface that you're gonna of the seams that you're gonna put together. Letting it dry for a good five minutes so it's ready to go. And then pressing it together really, really well. Um, I found that for the most part, that will keep foam together indefinitely. Yeah. Um, Gary Beer Money Props does a lot of foam work. He's been helping me out this week. And he was explaining to me that a uh, barge, like the only thing you have to be careful with about it after that is it is heat sensitive. Right. So if you get it too hot, so if you're still trying to do like heat forming or something afterwards, you got to be careful because if you get the barge too hot, it'll, it can separate again a right. little bit. Yep. Um, I found when I'm, when I'm making a certain, like a particular form out of foam, I rely more on cutting my seam lines so that when the foam gets pressed together, it, it creates those compound compound curves that I want. If, if I have to cut darts to get those shapes, then, then I'll do that. Um, I rely on that more than heat forming it. I would rather get it closer to where it needs to be by, you know, sort of forcing the foam into shape using the seams that it glues together. Yeah, uh, I agree. I spend a little yeah. more time on the patterning part. And right. then you won't have to fight it as much later. Yep. Let's see here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Good question. Ooh, this is a good one. This one's from Michael. He wants to know what's in the works for Dragon Con this year. Any big <laughs> plans? Um, yeah, I've got, um, like I said, if I can figure out the Blue Beetle thing, maybe that. I, I don't know how I would get six foot wings in a suitcase. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's a challenge getting those all the way across the country. So if I can figure out a way to make those collapse and still light up, I don't know. That's, Probably not going to happen, but I am going to make my very first League of Legends costume for Dragon Con. Um, even though I do not play the game, um, I'm doing. Uh, I gotta make sure I get this name right. I'm pretty sure I have it. Yeah, this is, yeah. Um, it was one of the alternate costumes that came out like a month ago. It's Heartseeker Varus. Okay. Um, which, if you look it up, is a preposterous, basically non-costume. He's got a little pleated skirt and a bow that lights up, and that is basically it. So that one, you're not going to have any problem getting into a suitcase. No, that should be the bow. I'll just have to make in two parts, like would you know, um, similar to what you were saying with the, the multi-part multi modes. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Oh wow, yeah, look at that. It's barely wearing anything. <laughs> Is kind of the way I do Dragon Con as much as possible. Um, that's what I get to for. He's got tiny little wings. Look at those little wings. Yeah, he's got the cute little feathered wings in the back, and I get to make a big prop that lights up and no costume, and it'll be really stupidly ridiculous, and uh, it should be just loads of fun. Um, I want to do, I've been watching a lot of um, The Last Airbender, the, uh, oh. what do you call it? And the and we watch we just binge watched like two seasons of the Legend of Korra. I kind of want to do a uh, with my brother do uh, oh. fire ferret outfits. I think that'd be so much fun. So cool. Yeah, we'll see. That'll be there'd be a lot of sewing in that. I'd be I'd be really, really stretching my abilities a bit. Um, but I think that would be really fun. Yeah, I know Kit has been wanting to do uh, Asami for a while, and I really want to make her. Crazy, like electrical gauntlet. Oh, I want to make those so bad. I have tons of reference images. <laughs> you let me know if you need those. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully it'll happen before too long. So, cool. Um, totally. Yeah, if she doesn't have saw me for for uh, Dragon Con, I will definitely do a fire ferret costume. All right. Good plan. So yes, Michael, that's what we have in, in store for Dragon Con. Some of the many many things. I may also completely rebuild my Destiny costume. I don't know. All right, uh, this one, uh, let's see, this one comes from uh, Jack Brick 101 
He says, I'm working on a beat up horned medieval fantasy helmet, and I'd like to know if you have any tips on painting a dulled or d dirty metallic paint job for the helmet, uh, along with tips for painting old yellowing horns. What do you think, Steven? Gonna make um, some beat up armor. Yeah, I think you've actually done some stuff about this by using like the cool weathering. Um, you know, like the, I can't think of the word, like there's the painting and the additives where you can actually like literally rust stuff and things like that. I think yeah. you've got some, some really good tutorials on that. Because that's, for like real world old stuff, I think that's definitely the best. Yeah, getting some really cool, either using acrylics to kind of fake rust or actually rusting stuff. Um, there's, uh, if you use metallic powders, like over here I've got, I'm pointing, you can't see it, but I'm pointing over there, there's a bunch of metallic powders I have. Um, if you get iron powder, that rusts into that nice orange rusty color. And you can mix up your own, um, uh, well, Harrison had a really good tutorial on it, on his Wonderflex armor. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but there's also this stuff, Sophisticated Finishes. They make their own antiquing solution. It's really yeah. just a solution that will oxidize metal. Um, so if you want to get a really real metallic rusting effect, that's the way to do it. Yeah, there's a couple of companies. I have some other stuff here. I can't remember the brand, but it's similar to that. And it's a series of, they've got like a... Uh, a patina and like a rust, like an old pewter and there. It's like the, the metal powders are in the paint and then you put some sort of solution over it and you can wear it out basically. Yeah, yeah. I would also say too, a lot of, if you want to make something look old in, in world worn, you want it to have a lot of texture to it. Uh, and then for metal specifically, I would base coat it all black. Hit it all with black and you'd be surprised how little silver you need to brush over that to make it look like metal. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, uh, like you might, you may immediately jump to thinking if I want it to look like metal, I just spray the whole thing with metal spray paint. I would say uh, instead base coat it in black and then brush silver over the highlights and edges. And that contrast really helps it pop and sell like dirty old metal. Yeah. If you're going for like old iron or something, Rust-Oleum makes those hammered metal finishes. Mm -hmm. yep. Some of those are really nice. And they make some that are really darker, like oiled bronze, which is basically yeah. black. Um, some of those, um, if you want it to not be quite as like old, but maybe not quite as dirty, uh, testers. Um, they make this stuff, the, the uh, Model Master buffable metalizers. Yeah, um, I like that stuff a lot. They're really cool, yeah, because it's it's spray paint and it basically sort of sprays out almost like oxidized, so it comes out a lot darker when it's dry. And if you buff it with a cloth, you can actually bring out the metal. So on anything with a lot of texture, it's really nice. You can put on like a nice dark layer and just polish the high points that would sort of get polished. Yeah. And you just automatically have some of that contrast. Right, yeah, again, it's, it's adding that contrast that really helps it pop. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jack Brick. That was a really good question. I like it. Uh, we just got a couple minutes here, so I think we'll grab one more question. The one that popped up here comes from JD. Uh, JD is looking to build a suit of armor from Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, has been having trouble finding templates or stencils for it. Do you have any places to go for it? Um, or how do you go about making patterns? So... For example, for your um, that arm that you made, you did a life cast of your arm, right? Is that how you did well, it? I actually took the, uh, the guy that it was for, we life cast him. Right. We happen to be the same size, so I can wear it. Which is well, that's, that's mighty handy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, we actually life cast his arm. And then because I knew mine was going to be fully sculpted, I just sculpted it in clay. Mm -hmm. so I didn't really have to pattern anything to fit around an arm. Um, but but if by having that, if you um, if folks have a thing they want to make from their body or that's going to fit on their body, if you have like I have a casting of my torso that I did out of plaster bandages, or if you do a um, uh, well, a duct tape dummy, yeah, you can build. Yeah, you can build the pieces right on there, and there's no guesswork involved. Yeah, you know it'll fit because it'll it'll fit on that on that life cast. Yeah, I like to do that because I have a duct tape torso of me. We just made a fiberglass one of kit. We did a plaster bandage mold and put fiberglass in it so it will last forever. 
and yeah, it's way easier because you can just pattern out of something easy like paper or cardboard or whatever, and just play with it till you get it right, and then. And you, hey, you, you were telling me a lot of what you do, um, you do out of cardboard first, right? Yeah, um, just because it's always around and it's basically free, mm -hmm. and especially for like armor pieces that are going to be rigid. I like to work with cardboard because I kind of get some structure. So I can yeah. see you know, if I need to cut darts or anything, I have to cut them in cardboard, whereas the paper you can kind of cheat a little more. Right. Um, so yeah, I like to use cardboard a lot because also that way if I want something to be bulky or somewhere, I just put more cardboard on top until I get it where I want it and then use the outer layer as the pattern. Yeah. So there you go, JD. I would highly recommend getting a life cast of your own torso. It doesn't have to cost a lot. The plaster one that I did of myself, I, I, my wife helped me. You need a friend to help you do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was maybe $20 in materials to do a, a casting, a plaster bandage casting of my torso. Uh, having that casting of your torso that you can work from makes doing patterning uh, a lot less painful. Yeah. And even a duct tape one will do most of what you need. If you look up um, like duct tape, duct tape dummies or uh, duct tape dress forms. Mm hmm actually what you'll find most but it works for men or women and that's you just need a friend and an old t-shirt yep there you go uh thank you jd for your question and thank you everyone else for your questions you guys are awesome you bring the you bring the uh the cool factor and the content for our show uh i really quickly wanted to mention that uh we have our patreon over at patreon.com punish props for this show, uh, there it is right now. We've got uh, 43 patrons, which is really, really cool. Uh, it's per week of content. We want to do more content per week, which is awesome because it doesn't cost you guys any more, uh, you wonderful people who are helping support the show. Uh, but the more the more patrons we get, the more we can afford, more content we can afford to bring to you guys, which means more live stream from the shop or we actually build stuff. My wife, Brittany, has one she's planning on doing here very soon. So look forward to that. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for being on the show, man. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. Folks, want to head over to soloroboto.com to check out what Stephen's got going on. And for more up-to-date stuff, we've got Solo Roboto Industries over on Facebook. You can see a project that he can't post about, so it's all pixelated. It's probably all genitals. <laughs> There's a Gary behind there, so I make no promises. <laughs> cool. All right, folks. We'll see you all next week for the next episode of Prop Live. Bye. <laughs>